Coming back from our coffee break. I put a, a slight modification into the code that we, we just wrote here. I put the digit 9 here. This specifies <coughs> that the string should have a width of exactly 9 characters. And in this way, I can, I can format my, my output in a way that's nicely aligned for writing tables. There are quite a number of commands to, to uh, modify and customize the behavior of the sprintf command. Um, and I will write a little cheat sheet on the most important ones that I will include in, in one of the next projects. So you can look that up. That is probably going to be useful. Are there any questions on what we've done so far? Then let's do some more. We mentioned quantiles. And I'd, I'd like to give you some more examples of how quantiles are really useful to look into data and see if, if data has particular properties. So <clears throat> the quantile is basically a threshold that has a given fraction of values above and below it. Now, if we if we um, calculate a number of, of values and look at the quantiles, um, I can illustrate better what that means. So we start with a small sequence of numbers from minus 4 to 4 in intervals of 0 0.1. And then for each of these x values, I calculate the expected density of the normal distribution with mean is 0 and standard deviation is 1. Excuse me, yep. What is the difference between R norm and D norm? That's what I'm just getting to. <clears throat> so there are For the inbuilt probability distributions, um, canonically there are always D versions, P versions, Q versions, <coughs> and R versions. So for the normal distribution, this is D norm, P norm, Q norm, R norm. For the uniform distribution, i.e. the same probability of values in some interval, it would be D unif, R unif, and so on. So D norm gives you the density, i.e the value of the, the function at that particular point. So using points that I calculate through D norm along a sequence of regularly spaced numbers allows me to make a plot of the function. So essentially, D norm is the Y value for an X value that I give it. OK, so my x values <coughs> are simply numbers from minus 4 to plus 4. My f values or function values are um, numbers that correspond to that. And now q90, q norm, is the quantile at the 90% density. So it's, an, it's a value that I can plot on the x-axis. And 90% of all the values of the normal distribution with the same parameters will be smaller than q norm, and 10% will be larger <coughs> than, than q norm. And then I can plot that. So let's, let's do a plot. Um, plots in R are very simple. You give some x value optionally some y value. Um, we can specify labels for the x and y axis. 
we can specify whether the type is lines or points or both and we'll get many more examples later on and in this case I also specify that I want a very thick line the default is one and I want a very thick black line here so if I if I execute this that's the plot I get Right? So this is, this is the normal bell-shaped normal distribution. So in the interval from minus 4 to 4, um, with the function values here and the density values here. Over this plot, I'm going to plot an AB line. AB lines are, are ways to, to draw single lines over a plot to emphasize something. Um, let me change this here. <clears throat> so there's other ways to call it, but two of the main ways are with V equals some value or with H equals some value. V means give me a vertical line at the Q90 value. H means give me a horizontal line at whatever value I request. <coughs> so an AB line vertical at Q90 um, and the color is supposed to be red and the line width should also be 5. Okay. <coughs> so 90% of all values are on the left-hand side of that red line and 10% of all values are on the right-hand side of that line. Often we think of uh, significant outliers as corresponding to plus minus two standard deviations. How can we plot a line that corresponds to two standard deviations into this plot? How do we calculate the standard? Do we need to calculate the standard deviation? No. So instead of V is equal Q90, which is V is equal to SD? No. Q90 is, is not precisely equivalent to a standard deviation. No, so we say don't use that, just use something different to use yeah, yeah, exactly. I need, I need, a, different, I, I need mm -hmm. a different value here. But what value should I use? Why? Why just use two? Standard deviation is one. Two is standard deviation. Why is standard deviation one? We assume the normal. Because I've defined it to be one. You're absolutely right. I've, I'm using uh, function values here for the normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So two standard deviations are the points at minus two and two. So let's look at the two standard deviations. A, B line, V equals. Let's plot two points here. We can do this, minus 2 and 2. And let's give it um, oh, let's just make it C green and line width of 2. So these are the two standard deviations. <clears throat> two standard deviations on one side correspond approximately to a Q90 for half the values. So if we would take the absolute values of the normal distribution, then the Q90 would be approximately two standard deviations. Um, if, if we if we take the entire set of values, and they can be much, much smaller than that, 
then the Q90 sh shifts to the left, obviously. <coughs> Okay, wow, so we've seen something interesting. We've seen plots in R, we've seen ways to generate plots for arbitrary functions or functions that are defined, and we've, we've seen one way to put more information into the plot by adding lines to the plot. Yes? What's the LHC word? Line defined? width. Line width. It's one of the plotting parameters. If we plot lines, <coughs> we can specify different line widths. Now, for plotting colors and, and lines, I actually do have a cheat sheet, which we'll get to in a moment. But it's not wrong to write it down right now. It makes it easier to remember. Um, <coughs> Now, if we take the same probability distribution for empirical quantiles. So these are theoretical quantiles. So this quantile, um, the value was obtained from Q norm. Empirical quantiles are quantiles that are determined from the data. So I don't know how the data is distributed. I happen to take it from the random values of the normal distribution. But you know, these, these could lie all over the place. So when I ask for the quantiles of this distribution, it tells me um, the range of the values that I got, i.e. the 0 and 100% quantiles goes from minus 2.3 to plus 2.6. And the 25 and 75% quantiles are um, in this range, and this gives me a small number. <clears throat> so that's the default for quantile x. But I can also specify quantile x with specifically requesting a certain set of probabilities. So the quantile of x for probabilities of 10%, 20%, and 90% can be calculated in the same way. 10, 20, and 90%. So these are now <clears throat> the actual empirical quantiles of, my, of the distribution that I give it. That's the way you would calculate quantiles um, for a distribution of data values. Of course, you don't know whether your data values correspond to a normal distribution or to a T distribution or binomial or whatever statistical distribution um, the data is drawn from. In the best case, an underlying model for a distribution could be obtained from your exploratory data analysis. But this is the way you can apply empirically the quantiles to your data. Essentially, what you do is you rank them, and then you cut off the ranks at, at, these, at these cut points. So let me reproduce my plot here to recreate it. Now, since my x values were taken from the same kind of normal distribution with the same mean and the same standard deviation, I can plot these quantile lines over my plot to get the 10, 20, and 90% quantiles. Here we go. So the 10, um, wait. Something went wrong. So this is the ninety percent quantile of my empirical distribution, and this is the red line is the 90% quantile of the theoretical distribution. So they're close, but they don't exactly coincide. Why? Well, because my random numbers more or less conform to the shape of the normal distribution. 
So these are empirical quantiles. A good way to, to uh, characterize data are, is uh, box plots. That's another way of, of producing plots. So again, <clears throat> now we'll, get, we'll take more values. We'll take 1,000 normal deviates and with a mean of 5 and a standard deviation of 2.5 and box plot x. <clears throat> this, this is uh, the box plot of, of this distribution. Many parameters. Um, I thought I would have. A little sketch of what these what these numbers mean, uh, what these lines mean. So anyway, um, the black line in the middle is the median. The box um, characterizes the interquartile range. The, I believe the whiskers uh, characterize the 10 and 90 percent interquartiles. Uh, and in the default, Outliers are explicitly shown as little circles, so that you can see whether and how many data you have that um, lie far out of this distribution. Now, <clears throat> if we, we have to be a little bit careful with box plots. They're, they're quite useful to basically get an idea of the distribution and, and compare distributions of different data. But they can also obscure important structure. So if we, uh, for example, if we have a bimodal distribution, i.e. a distribution that is composed of 100 values um, of a normal distribution centered on minus 2 and 100 of a normal distribution centered on 2. And we add them to each other. So the second time I, r I run this command, I combine or concatenate the vectors for x with the new values. Now x is 200 data points long. Right, 200 data points long. And the first 100 data points are centered on minus 2, and the second 100 are centered on 2. If I do a box plot of that, it's basically indistinguishable from what I did before. You might maybe say for a normal distribution, um, the inner value seems suspiciously uh, large, but you know nothing to, to tell you that this is actually a bimodal distribution. If we want the actual values, or the actual shape of the distribution, we can do a histogram. And that clearly shows us this is not a unimodal distribution. There are two peaks in here, and the box plot obscures that. So there's, there's other ways than just box plots to calculate, to look at the similar data. A pretty good way to do this is the so-called violin plot. So the violin plot um, is like a box plot, but instead of drawing a box, it basically draws on both sides of the line um, a density curve, like a histogram that's, that's put on its side that will show you where the distributions are. So in basic R, there are no um, violin plots. We need the ggplot package to plot violin plots. So um, let me see if this works. I have it installed. If you need to install it, it'll probably download lots of stuff. 
Now, <clears throat> um, ggplot has a very different a syntax that's very different from basic R. Um, first, I convert my vector x into a data frame. And then I define that there's a basic plot. And then I add to the basic plot the violin plot um, geometry. And that's what I get. So this is a violin plot of our bimodal distribution with ggplot. Lauren will tell you all about what this syntax is and what the pluses mean and how that works. Um, you'll see that it's a quite different concept of how to, how to get R to, to, to do things. Now, if we plot more than one column with a box plot, the plots get uh, plotted side by side. So if we do um, a box plot of two columns of LPS dat, we get these two columns, and the call names are automatically uh, uh, transferred into the plot window. Um, this is a way to first draw the box plots of the standards and then the box plot of the LPS. And we can put in a separating line into the middle between these plots. So we have these two windows. And now if I extend this far to the right. Even further. How far do I need to go? This is maybe not a good example. There we go. Now we have all of them. Right, so I can, I can make a nice plot of all of my data, um, arrange it in different ways, label it in different ways, and so on. Yeah, so as, as you notice, R doesn't just um, overwrite data values. It makes an intelligent guess about how much uh, it doesn't just overwrite labels, it makes an intelligent guess about how much space it needs for its labels and then adjusts whatever it prints into the plot accordingly. So, Boris, would you mind just going through the um, comment that produced this graph? So, what's the 5, 2, and 14? Right, so that was. Where are we here? <clears throat> so I'm creating a sequence of numbers here, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and 14. These are the column indices of the control values. And I'm creating a second sequence of numbers of three, five, and so on, up to 15. So if I put that together, I have these <coughs> indices here of column indices. And in this way, I order my box plots. So the first set of box plots are for all of the cell types, the control values. The second set of box plots are for all the um, values, the the stimulated values, the LPS stimulated <coughs> values. So this expression simply orders um, the, the columns in a particular way.
And since <clears throat> by default, um, the first box plot is centered on the numerical value 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, then putting in an AB line at 7.5 draws me a nice separating line between the two sets. Sure. In one command, can you do B equals 7.2 comma 2.5 comma 4.5 comma? Like what would be the structure? <clears throat> oh, let me let me change that. So. Let's just say here, um, we plot one, uh, 2 to 15. And now I want ab lines after every cell type. So I want the app lines positioned from um, starting at 2.5, and the last one would be 13.5. Um, by equals 2. So these would be the values for the app line. Yeah, and that's it. Oh, that's color them red just. Color is not a graphical parameter, that's true. It's call. Invalid A and B specifically, and that's also true. I forgot to put the V there. There we go. So it's very flexible. Um, <clears throat> once again, in, in, in producing R plots, you're not at all limited to what any kind of package offers. You have all the flexibility to completely customizing your plots and coming up with different plots on your own. I, I always thought maybe I should um, <clears throat> write an example of how to do a violin plot in base R using a function that's called density, which does density estimation, and basically takes a distribution like a histogram and then draws a smooth line that approximates the curve. But maybe that would be more confusing than illuminating. So maybe just take my word for it. You could do it. <laughs> and it's not even that hard. Very flexible. Um, sorry, I'm shifting the window so much. Um, I've, I've been asked to increase the font size even further for the benefit of uh, those in the back row. I hope that those in the back row feel terribly benefited and it's now actually readable to everyone. And I just have to drag things around a lot more. OK. Now let's look more at plots. Let's explore some plot types and some lines. So there's a, there's a plotting reference script here, which has um, an introduction to some types of plots and how to work with colors and what lines there are and how to use coordinates and how to place titles and legends and different types of plot symbols and so on. Um, the whole file, there's a lot to think about plots, so the whole file is, is rather lengthy, but we'll, we'll take some highlights here. And um, it's often um, very useful to, to go through that 
and, and explore it some more at home. So we often use the normal distribution for sample data. Um, this is what the normal distribution looks like in a simple plot. <clears throat> so here I create a sequence of values for my x-axis. I create function values with uh, using d norm, and then plot my x-axis against my function values. Um, I put a label here, and I put a label there, and I specify a certain line width and a certain type. So that's what underlies a lot of the data we have here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so here's a, here's a plot of x and y values. Um, x is just normal distribution um, of 200. Y is these values cubed times the scaling factor plus uh, some other random values. And let's look at what that looks like. So it's, it's kind of, um, since I now have different values for x and y, and I'm varying them, I'm getting uh, in a scatter plot. So this is, for, for x and y values, the default way to plot things. This is a scatter plot of, um, of these values. By default, the scatter plot is uh, plotted with circles, not with lines, and the circles are empty, not filled white. So, so they overlap each other. Um, that's the standard uh, s s scatter plot. There's a, a fun type of plot which is called a rug plot. Um, the rug plot has little hair sticking out. <laughs> so you have a little rug that's added here. Um, this visually allows to see what the density of the points is in one of these proje uh, projections. So that's, if there's a lot of data points that obscure each other, a rug plot um, added to the, the graphics can give you a better indication of how these how these densities uh, actually look like. Um, by default, the rug is done for the values that are plotted on the x-axis. Um, if I want the values for the y-axis, I can, I can specify that with side equals 2, which puts it to the left-hand side. And I can also specify the color. So this is the rug plot for the y-axis and the rug plot for the x-axis. <clears throat> um, bar plots are the kind of plots that we encounter most frequently in, in, in our types of seminars. Let's, let's make some bar plots. So we have um, 200 values for y. And if we use the round function, we can, we can uh, round these y values into integers. So these are the y values. Um, <clears throat> the function table takes a set of elements. And these could be characters or numbers or something. And it counts the number of occurrences. So it, it gets a table of the kind of elements that I have in a vector. So a table of this looks like this. It tells me I have um, one value of minus 3, five values of minus 2, 90, 90 values of 0, um, one value of 4, and so on. That's extremely useful to character to say count, uh, especially categorical variables. Uh, we use table a lot for that. So this now gives me a number of categories and a number of values, which I can then cast into a bar plot. And then that's this bar plot.
Okay. Ähm. <coughs> Let's illustrate this in a different way. Let's make a bar plot of um, let's make a bar plot of, of uh, nucleotides in a, in a gene, of random nucleotides. So how do we get random nucleotides? Uh, let's assume that the frequencies of our random nucleotides should be uniform. So all we need to do is we use sample, and we sample from the vector A, C, G, T. Let's make it a longish gene. Um, Let's say it's 693 uh, bases long. And of course, we need to um, set replace to true. So these are our 600 and whatever random ACTG. So what's the what's the distribution of A's, C's, and T's and G's? So for that we simply ask for a table of this. 172A, 177C, 178G, and 166T. And if we bar plot that, we have, we have this distribution here. And now notice we don't have 1, 2, 3, 4, but A, C, G, T. Because these were the categories. Now, table, um, table already has these things. <coughs> and they're set as um, an attribute, which is called dim names or dimension names here. Now, if I wanted to have my own vector of some other values and say 2648 and I bar plot this I don't get any category names because none have been defined. If I define names and then bar plot, I get the names in my plot. So that's something you, you might wonder about. How do I get the names as the labels into the bar plot? Answer is you have a vector of numbers that you want to plot, and you define the, the category labels as names.
if we produce the numbers with the table function, the, the names are already defined. If we do a bar plot of a two-dimensional object, um, it automatically takes the column names as the names that it uses. Histograms are very versatile. Um, the simplest way to do a histogram of a set of numbers is just to say histx. So this is the default histogram of 50 normally distributed values. But sometimes it's, or often it is, it is very useful not to just use the default values but to explicitly specify the boundaries. So what R does, it makes a usually very good guess about what the boundaries for the individual bars in the histogram should be. And you can apply uh, different algorithms to determine the boundaries. But you can also specify that, for example, you would like five columns and not more, uh, or, or five column breaks by saying hist x breaks equals 5. Then the algorithm will try to use five breaks for the histograms, and it will usually honor this, except if the data is very far off and it can't do anything reasonable with it, then it will instead do something that's more reasonable. So now this is a histogram with five categories. Previously, it gave us, I think, 10 or so. So, excuse me, so this five, does that refer to the gaps the, yep. The scale? Five breaks. One, two, three, four, five. Five breaks in the data. <clears throat> Instead of saying five breaks, I can also give it a vector of values. And the vector of values um, should cover the range of data. And for example, I can then split things up um, in, into seven quantiles or whatever. So like a, b line, the, the vectors of values would be explicit. So um, let's say this should go from minus 3 and then the next one should be at 0. And then I want right. So I'm not confined to having the same x range. I can specify whatever numbers I want um, in whatever breaks I want. Right, so here I have a very large set, and uh, here I have smaller sets. Um, <clears throat> Like a rub, rug plot in a scattered plot, I can use a strip chart plot on a histogram to give me the actual data values. And that's a very good thing because I'm, I'm not that much hiding data anymore. So you can see even though this, this range is from minus 3 to 2, it actually only contains a single value which is much closer to 2 than it is to minus 3. It's just the way that um, getting at 5 breaks was, was distributed over the interval of, of possible numbers. <coughs> now, histogram has, has two um, 
uh, behaviors. One is the side effect of plotting, but it also has an actual return value. And the return value are the parameters it used uh, in constructing the plot. So if we call these parameters info, um, and we calculate the same histogram, now info contains these values here. It tells me exactly where the brakes were set. And for example, I can use that to modify the brakes if I want. It tells me what the counts were. I can extract that and do some numerical computations with these counts. It tells me what the densities were. So basically, this is um, sum of values or, or, or the number of values divided by the counts for each category. It tells me where it placed the midpoints on the plot. Um, it tells me what the name of my variable was. It tells me whether it um, used equidistant uh, breaks and so on. So getting out these numbers can, can be useful. It may come up in one of the examples where we actually modify a histogram. So to access any of these, we do have to say info dot Dollar yep, exactly. Info dollar breaks gives me these values. <clears throat> we can We can color the bars individually into different colors. Say histogram color. And then generic plots have parameters like colors and the title of the main and the X labels and the Y labels um, that I can, I can apply. So these are the colors that I defined. These are counts. This is a Greek letter sigma. <clears throat> because the axis here is labeled in terms of standard deviations because I used a, a, a standard deviation normal uh, distribution. How do I get a Greek letter sigma? Well, that's, that can be a bit involved, but you can put um, explicit um, formulas on these on these labels. Uh, for more details, you'll you'll need to find a tutorial on with Google somehow. But the the key here is to use the expression function, which essentially um, um, constructs formulas similar to to w the way it would be done with LaTeX. So we can put not just simple text, but more explicit formulas and, and, and intricate uh, labels into our plots. And here's a way to actually use the information and adding the individual counts to the plot. So we've just done this plot here. Um, <clears throat> when I plotted it, I assigned it to um, the value to, to the variable h, so h dollar mids, for example, is now the midpoints of these breaks. And I can use these to, to plot the values. Because um, h dollar mids gives me the midpoint of each bar on the histogram h dollar counts gives me the height of each bar on the plot. So this is the x and y coordinate on which I can place a little bit of text, i.e. the text of the counts. And the counts I can find in h dollar counts. And I adjust this a little bit um, to the right and um, to the bottom and use the same color. The essential command is text. Like a B line, or like we'll later encounter the command line, 
text also puts something on a plot. So in this case, the command text h dollar mids h dollar counts and so on gives me the actual values. Sorry, can you please explain again why h dollar counts is there two times? X, Y, text. I see. Sorry. Right? So the value 6 is plotted at the level 6 at this X value. So this is the X and y, y value, but the contents of this has to be text. It could be something else. <clears throat> right? But I. I give it these numbers, and then these numbers are converted um, into text. OK, so this is histogram is, is, is very, very flexible. And almost all, all plot or all plotting functions are as, are as flexible as that. Yeah? After the x, y, and text, there's also adjusted c. Right. This adjusts the text um, a little bit to the top and to the right, otherwise it would fall right into, into the plot. I think you can <clears throat> you can easily practice some more with that. Uh, if if you try things and, and play with things and, and you don't seem to be able to get the result that you want, um, ask me or ask ask our TAs when you get a chance. I'd like to spend a little time on on uh, QQ plots, quantile to quantile plots. Because that's something that I'd like to apply to, to our data. Remember, we calculated um, the, the standard deviations for the individual columns. And we saw different, differing values. I would be curious whether the standard deviations of our, our expression enrichments are normally distributed. So the differences between these values, do these correspond to a normal distribution, or is there something else going on? If it's just noise, I would expect them to correspond to a normal distribution. But how, how can we tell the difference? So using QQ plots is one way to test whether something is, um, corresponds to, similarly distributed to a, to a, to a normal distribution. So let's again build some random values, uh, normally deviated, and, and plot the function qq norm. So if these would be random numbers, according to a normal distribution, in terms of theoretical quantiles, this is where we would find them. This is where we actually found them in practice. These lie on a straight line. And that tells me the distribution of the sample quantiles is the same as the theoretical quantiles um, for a normal distribution. Or in other words, there's nothing that distinguishes um, 
my sample quantiles from a normal distribution, which is expected because I, I constructed them from um, a normal distribution. Now let's look <coughs> at what this looks like if we take a, a, a T distribution instead. So the, the T distribution from uh, T tests. So we, like we did before, we create a sequence from minus four to four of, of uh, small differences. And we build a first function which is normally distributed. And we build a second set of function values which are distributed according to the t-test. So this is, this is the normal distribution. Now, into this plot, <coughs> I would like to plot my second distribution, so as an overlay. And the way I do this in, in, the, uh, in the most general case is to use the lines command. So <clears throat> we've encountered um, a B line. We've encountered um, text to put new elements into the plot. Um, there's ways to draw boxes. There's ways to draw polygons. But this is a way to draw lines. So if I want to draw another curve, I just plot the curve point by point from the lines. And this simply is the command um, <coughs> along the x values, the f2 values. It, it looks exactly as uh, the plot values. Um, only I don't have to specify the X and Y labels because these are given. I don't have to specify the density of tick marks or the size of anything. This draws only the line. And what's important to remember is it draws the lines into the last used coordinate system. So the absolute values of, and the ranges of the X and the Y axis of the plot window will be taken from the last plot it produced. And this is why the lines that I plot here can be overlaid perfectly on, on the last plot. So this is the T distribution. The T distribution has fatter tails. So it's higher in, in the tails of the distribution than, no, than the normal distribution. Now, if I want to label that and, and add a legend which line is which, I can use the legend command. Normal and T2. Things are a little squished here. Um, <clears throat> so that I know what which line color corresponds to what. You might have noticed if you looked carefully that I can specify colors explicitly by the color names. And I think at some point we'll be talking more about colors. There are 656 recognized color names which are hard-coded into R. Um, different grays, and red, and black, and green, and sea green, and fire brick, and uh, dodger blue, deep sky, dark violet, um, dark orange, chocolate, coral. Is there mauve? There's maroon. We don't have mauve. How strange. Do we have petrol? No petrol, but peach puff, papaya whip, pink, and plum. So most of the useful colors are there. There's this nice um, theory that guys know red, green, and blue, and women know a lot more, so may even be, be able to associate a difference between plum and purple and violet. So you can use them. 
Of course, that means you need to remember them. Um, the way I usually specify colors is by so-called hex codes, hex values. So a, <clears throat> a hexadecimal value is um, a numbering system that goes from, uh, th that has, um, that has 16 values per digit. So it goes from 0 to 9 and then continues into A, B, C, D, E, F to make 16. And if you have two of these numbers, 16 by 16, um, this gives 255 from 0 to 255 or 256 different values. And that's how internally a byte of information is structured. So hex values from A to F often comes up when we look at, at machine code. So the way that colors are specified in hex values, they're usually prepended with a, a hash mark. Now in this case, that hash mark does not mean comment. And then six hexadecimal values, <coughs> where the first two specify the intensity of red, the second two specify the intensity of green, and the last two specify the intensity of blue. So red, green, blue. So this value, what, does, what is this color? Black. So the intensity of red, green, and blue are exactly zero. This is equal to red. So if I specify to plot something in red or I specify something as hex FF000, it's the same thing. Usually when I plot things with red, I find this too brilliant and garish, and I tone it down to CC. It kind of makes a nicer look, I think. Classy. More classy. Um, yeah, I'm not going to do this now. Um, <clears throat> What would this be? Yellow. Yellow. So full intensity red, full intensity green gives a yellow color. Full intensity green, full intensity blue, we call that cyan. Full intensity red, full intensity blue is called magenta. So we can get um, cyan, yellow, and magenta, or red, green, and blue from the combinations. Now there's a, there's a shorthand um, for that. Um, in R, we can also specify the colors for plots as numbers. So one is black, two is red, um, three, I believe, is green, four is blue, and so on. So you can just iterate through these numbers and then, then generate a certain limited set of numbers. Um, that's often very quick and easy to do. For example, if you have a cluster and then you have cluster categories one to five, and then you can just use the cluster categories to color your cluster elements. Um, it just doesn't look nice. So plotting in these, these these primary colors usually um, um, it looks cheap. It looks cheap. So it's better to know more about how to actually specify numbers in a satisfying way. But that's what I did here. Color equals 1 and 2. So color takes a vector um, for the legend, first color and second color, and this here. 
into the legend. Okay, let's get back. Um, let's use QQ plot to compare these normally distributed samples with the T distributed samples. Remember, normal distribution was um, take. Um, we can take empirical values from R T. So, like our norm. Um, uh, D norm, we have RT, DT, and, and so on for the T distribution. So 100 T distributed samples with two degrees of freedom um, in a QQ norm plot. This looks like this. So now, um, in this example, you see something that significantly deviates from normality. In the center, it kind of correlates well. But you can see that the tails are anything but normal. So this is, this is what a distribution looks like that cannot be scaled into a normal distribution. There's significant deviation along the lines. Um, we can add a line to this, QQ line. Color is 2. Actually, I will uh, no, let's, let's plot it like that first. Um, that places a line where the data points would fall if it, if my sample quantiles would correspond to a normal distribution. So it makes it very obvious um, how large the different sample values um, uh, disagree with the normal <coughs> distribution. If I, if I change this to code slightly less bright. I don't know. I like this better. Okay. We can also do QQ plots of sample against sample. So if you have a set of control values, um, <coughs> you can then plot um, the sample quantiles against your control quantiles and determine from that whether there is a significant difference or an obvious difference uh, between uh, these distributions. So this is a part of data exploration. Your control values might correspond to um, the values that you would expect for your, um, your some measurements that you do with a control cell line and then you have sample values and you can use um, QQ plot sample against sample um, to plot that. Now, note that this is now not QQ norm. QQ norm is a QQ plot of a sample against the normal distribution. But the command QQ plot plots sample against sample. So let's define within that QQ plot x values as a normal distribution. Um, t values as taken from the t distribution and then let's do a QQ plot and it kind of looks like the previous plot. More patchy because the, the samples are in less predictable intervals but you can see that at the tails we have the same uh, big difference of effects. Can you specify which part size you want? What do you what do you mean in terms of the data? In terms of the uh, QQ plot, um, so I assume by default that uh, the number of plot quartiles, say one percent, two percent, mm -hmm. and so on, are plotted against each other. Can we change that default? Well, is that the first well, the first question? Is is that the true assumption? And if so, can we change that default? If that makes sense. You can specify the type of quantile computation. Um, <laughs> uh, 
and uh, it gets a bit involved there. So there are nine possible quantile algorithms, and they're discussed in this, in this reference paper, and they can be selected by type, and they're listed here for discontinuous sample and continuous sample quanti quantiles and so on. So you can, you can customize it from that, um, customize the quantiles. Um, if you only want a certain range, though, only low values or only high values, then you simply uh, use the quantiles to uh, take a subset of your data points that you compare. Right? So if you only want from the mean to the high points and, and ignore the low points, then, then, you, then you simply subset your, your data values and, and, and use them. Okay, <clears throat> let's... I'm sorry, if, uh, <coughs> to follow on that, if we subset our data, how does QQ plot know that it is a subset? I mean, does it not try to find quartiles on the new subset? In other words, does it not assume that the new subset is a complete data set and then try to find quartiles on that new data set, which is a subset of the original data? Would it matter? I don't think it would matter. I think it would. As long as you, as you compare the right quantiles w w with each other, it doesn't really matter where in the whole distributions they are in terms of plotting it. So let's try this. Think of columns of LPS data that you could compare with a QQ plot, and then explore this and interpret the result. So perhaps, um, just as one suggestion, but you could think of different things, is ask if uh, the QQ plots of um, Right. Right. So if you have a cell line and, and an induced cell line, um, what do, does the does the induction look like something um, of random noise being added to it, or is there some trend that you can discern? So so try try using a QQ plot on on some of the LPS data and think about what kind of question you would like to ask. So essentially the QQ plot allows you to, to quantitatively compare two distributions. Are two distributions the same or are two distributions different? This is where your, your actual knowledge comes in, the biology. What kind of a distribution would be of interest from, from this data? What kind of a change in distributions could be of interest? And if you're stuck and you have no idea and um, you need help, put up a red post-it.